Mr. McCoy here with part 12 of The Ear, The Eye, and The Arm. It was night when Chipo fetched Tendai to come and eat. You look so comfortable, I let you sleep, she said. Tendai followed her as she waddled ahead of him on the trail. She seemed extremely young to be pregnant, but he wasn't good at judging women's ages. They came to the village where several fires now bloomed. Rita was dressed in a bark sarong and couldn't stop grinning. Isn't it wonderful? We're free and we're clean. Not without work, remarked Mayanda, who was kneeling on a grass mat beside a pot of bubbling rapoco. You should have heard Kuda yell when she scrubbed him, said Rita. Kuda sat next to several other boys of similar age. He glared resentfully at Mayanda. He won't attract the vultures now, said the big woman, stirring the rapoco vigorously. Oh, she almost dropped the wooden spoon. What's that around your neck? Tendai felt his chest. That's an Nadoro I found in the mine. Chipo and several other women gathered around him. Their stares made him uneasy. It's old, said one woman. Real shell, not like the pottery one our spirit medium wears, said another. One of them timidly put out her hand, but drew back before she could touch it. Is he going to stay? The first woman asked. I don't know. I was going to feed him with the boys, but I suppose I'd better seat him with the men. He'll have his own bowl, Mayanda said. Tendai felt a little insulted. He knew the reason he would not eat from the communal bowl was because he might come from a family of witches. Modern people didn't believe in them, but the Rest Haven people did, after all, knew nothing of his background. He forgave them. He was led to the dare, the men's meeting place, which was surrounded by a sketchy fence. Mayanda bowed and withdrew. Tendai looked around at the solemn villagers. They all sat on low stools, and they were all older than he. Some were ancient. They waited to be greeted. Tendai suddenly felt he was in over his head. What did you say to elders? Three hundred years old. Their rules of etiquette were strict and inflexible. That much he remembered. The silence grew. Tendai broke out in the sweat, although the evening was cool. He touched the Nadoro and imagined the mellower standing in his place. The mellower had many times described the exact way a stranger entered a village. Tendai took a deep breath, bent forward, and z-slapped his hands in a masculine way. That is, his palms were flat and held vertically above the ground, not cupped and horizontal to it after the manner of women. This was done softly to alert the men to his presence. Please excuse me, grandfathers. May I be allowed to clap hands? No one forbade him, so he clapped again loudly four or five times and greeted each man politely. Since he didn't know their totems, he wasn't able to do it perfectly. They seemed to accept this because they addressed him in turn. They too clapped in greeting. They indicated that he should sit on the ground, as was correct for a mere boy. Tendai sat with his knees flexed almost in a lotus position with his hands on his ankles. This, he remembered, was a position of humility. He couldn't remember whether it was a posture of a son-in-law approaching his father-in-law or a servant his master or just anybody approaching a chief. Again, no one corrected him, but no one smiled either. Tendai felt sweat break out again. He didn't know what to do next, so he stared down at his ankles and waited. It would be good to know how we may greet this stranger, said an old man with a stern face. It would be a mark of politeness to know his family. Then Tendai understood that they wanted to know his totems, the Mutupu of his father and Chideo of his mother. This was a custom that had almost entirely died out in modern Harar. It was rather like the English custom of shaking hands. The original use was to find out whether your visitor was armed. The purpose of knowing totems was to work out a relationship, if possible. He ceremoniously announced father's Mutupo, the lion, and mother's Chideo, the heart. Our Mutupo is also the lion, said the old man with slightly more friendliness. And my third wife is of the heart clan, said another man. Third wife? thought Tendai. The men went back to conversing among themselves. Eventually they let Tendai know their names. The old man was called Garikai, and most of the others were his younger brothers. They didn't reveal too much about their totems because such information could be used by witches. Slowly, Tediously, the conversation wound on. Most of it involved cattle. Tendai didn't know too much about how much you could say about such boring animals until the men got going. 
Then he learned that each creature had a personality. They had bad habits, silly cravings, and just about every weakness a person might have. Since he didn't know the cattle personally, Tendai's head began to nod. He jolted awake when the water was brought. The women arrived with pots that they set before the men. Rita appeared, her face with tears. She slammed a pot down in front of Tendai, causing several of the men to raise their eyebrows. Everyone washed hands as the women went back to fetch dinner. So why do you suppose Rita is slamming the pot down in front of Tendai? I bet you know. Share with your fellow listener. Each wife came in with a communal bowl, knelt, and presented it to her husband. The women retired immediately. Tendai noticed that both Mayanda and Chipo presented bowls to Garyaki. Then Rita came in. She knelt and practically flung two small bowls, satsa, and relish at his feet. Thank you, whispered Tendai. He noticed the men did not thank their wives. Don't expect me to do this when we get home, Rita whispered back. She disappeared before he could say more. The men solemnly clapped their hands and said, Pamosaro, excuse me, as was polite when preparing to dine. They ate from the communal bowls, going methodically from one to the next, except for Tendai, who was expected to keep separate. No one spoke now. They attended to the serious business of eating. Tendai saw that while each large bowl contained satsa, not all the relishes were the same. Most were a mix of tomatoes, onions, and chilies, like the relish Rita had brought him, but one was composed of toasted termites, another of small dried fish, and a third was a platter of fried mice. Tendai was just as happy not to be included in the communal dinner. The men didn't seem that fond of fried mice either. They left half of them on the platter. At the end of the meal, everyone washed hands again. A troop of boys arrived to carry off the bowls. After a few moments, the boys returned and greeted their elders before sitting on the ground. A few older women entered the dare to listen, and Chipo squeezed herself in by the boys. Gariaki told them to bring her a stool. Tendai could see he was very proud of her pregnancy. A mutter of anticipation went around the gathering. A few men lit clay pipes with hot coals and puffed out a rank smoke. Gariaki cleared his throat. <clears throat> what is the small pot that feeds the whole family? He asked a child of about five. The cook fire, honored grandfather, replied the boy. Who is the toddler who topples even the chief? Gariaki inquired of a youth about Tendai's age. Sleep, O Sekiro, he answered. Around the fire went the riddles until each child had answered. They were tradition, and Tendai had heard most of them. When his turn came, Gariaki asked, My mother's house has no door. What am I? An egg, answered Tendai promptly. The men nodded, and he knew he had passed the test. Then the elders asked each child to recite a proverb. The old sayings had a purpose in village life, but they were completely meaningless in modern Harad. Tendai had trouble remembering them. Don't touch the back of your head while walking or someone in your family will die, said a boy. A boy who peeks into the cooking pot will beat his wife when he grows up. If you squat on a path, you'll get boils on your backside. Tendai saw a kind of logic to this one. It was the adult's way of keeping the little children from using a public walkway as a toilet. So what sayings are you familiar with, and why do we have those sayings? Share with your fellow listener. If you sing while you're eating, you'll get mumps, said a child who looked as though he might sing a lot when his mother wanted quiet. If you eat while lying down, you'll grow two navels. Weird, definitely weird, thought Tendai. Then they came to him. If a black cat crosses your path, you'll have bad luck hazarded Tendai. Never heard that one, said one man. I've never seen a black cat. Are you sure that's a Shauna proverb, said another. Gariaki pointed to the next boy, and Tendai knew he had failed that test, whatever it was. Why should I care, he thought. I'm going home tomorrow, but he found himself wanting to please them. Gariaki started a chant that turned into a story. It was clear everyone knew it. But the people settled themselves down happily just as Kuda did when the mellower recited Peter Rapid for the first time. Gariaki said, Once there was a man. The audience responded, Go on. Gariaki, That man was a king. The audience said, Go on. Gariaki said, He had a daughter. The audience said, Go on. 
Gariaki said, as beautiful as the sun, the audience said, go on. The story continued in this way, half music, half poetry, as Gariaki told them of a king who placed his daughter on a platform over a big nest of bees in a tree. Anyone who wanted to marry her had to climb over the bee's nest. All the young men got stung so badly they fell to the ground. At this point, the audience's response changed to, Oh, oh, the bees sting. Oh, my mother. Tendai thought it was a pleasant way to tell a story. It involved everyone and made them part of the unfolding adventure. In fact, as Tendai joined in with the responses, clapped his hands and swayed with the others, he felt a wonderful sense of belonging. These were his people. He was part of them. It was like being held in many, many arms. Gariaki told them that one day a man arrived who had a bad skin disease. He was covered with scabs. He was disgusting to look at, and the other men laughed at him. The ugly man climbed the tree, but when the bees came out to sting him, they couldn't get through the scabs. So at this point, you are going to get to participate out there in the audience. I will read Gariaki's line. You will read the audience line. You'll see it up here on the screen in just a moment. Whenever I pause, that will be your cue. So here we go. His skin was like a rock. The bees stung him. They broke their stingers. They fell all over the ground. The ugly man reached the princess and carried her down. The king married his beautiful daughter to him, and the other suitors were sent home in disgrace. Gariaki said, This is where Serangano, the storyteller, died, which was the traditional way of ending a tale. The mellower sometimes said that, but more often he ended with, and they lived happily ever after. Everyone sighed with satisfaction. Tendai thought it was hard luck for the princess to marry someone covered with scabs. Mellower would have cured the man of his skin problem. An elder with gray hair and a beard began a fable about a baboon. The animal was tired of getting hungry and he asked a rabbit to sew up his bottom so no food could get out. Later, he couldn't get the stitches out. The poor baboon swelled up until his paw stuck out straight. Everyone roared with laughter when the stitches finally broke. Tendai was embarrassed. Of course he had heard such stories, but not from dignified old men. He was glad Rita wasn't present. We would be honored, said Gariaki, breaking in on Tendai's thoughts, if our visitor from afar would recount something from his people. Tendai felt as though a big spotlight had suddenly switched on. Everyone fell silent and turned toward him. He could hear the fire rustle and the distant clunk of dishes being washed. He stood up on rubbery legs. His mouth opened. No sound came out. Tendai laid his hands on the door. What could make a better story than his own kidnapping? He took a deep breath, remembering that the mellower always did that before starting a praise. I come from a faraway land, he began. Go on, said a few people in the audience. My father is a chief. Well, he is, thought Tendai. He's chief of security. Go on, said the audience. My brother and sister and I went on a trip. Go on, said all of the people sitting around. Slowly, Tendai wove the events of their enslavement, the finding of the Nodoro and the shaft of light sent by the ancestors into a magnificent tale. Even he could tell it was well done. The shining eyes of the listeners told him he had utterly captured their attention. All those nights listening to the mellower had given him the skills he needed now. Tendai changed the tale to remove all mention of modern things. At the end, he substituted a magic cooking pot for the bus that carried them to rest haven. This is where Sarango, the storyteller, died, he finished. Ah, what a good tale, a young man said. Wonderful! He has a shave for storytelling, agreed another. But that was why the Nodoro was sent to him, exclaimed Gariaki, and everyone nodded. It's perfectly clear an ancestor waited in that mine for several years, many, many years, until he found a willing person to possess. He might even be a spirit medium when he gets older, said the first young man. Everyone brightened up at this idea. Tendai began to feel uneasy. So why do you suppose Tendai began to feel uneasy? Share with your fellow listener. And now, moments more of the ear, the eye, and the arm. I would never criticize our spirit medium, 
said the elder who had told the baboon story, but he has never been good at poetry. He can't keep a beat, although he's an excellent witch finder, said the young man, looking nervously around. Well, that's settled, Gariaki said. I was a little worried when this boy didn't know the Proverbs, but it's clear the ancestors have sent him. I vote. He stays. Yes, yes, everyone cried. A hubbub of voices drowned out Tendai's objections. The people rose to go. The women appeared from the shadows to whisk the smaller boys off to bed. The young men helped the elderly to rise. Laughing and talking, they left the dare. Wait, what's going on? Tendai called. Gariaki turned back briefly. You can stay, provided the spirit medium agrees to it. But I don't want to. I, I need to call my parents on the holophone. Gariaki stumped on up the path, leaning on a twisted cane until he was met by his two wives. It was Mayanda who finally came for Tendai and led him to the boy's hut. Don't mention holophones if you know what's good for you, she said in a low voice. I have to. I can't stay. It's out of my hands. They all think the ancestor sent you and Gariaki has forbidden me to open the gate. For how long? Tendai felt as though the ground had dropped out from under his feet. Don't you know, you poor fool, said Miyanda. Once Rest Haven has accepted you, you can never go home again. We'll find out what happens to Tendai, not to mention Rita and Kuda, as the ear, the eye, and the arm continues.